All right. So uh, the next few sections, we are going to build an actual network here, a wireless network at least, into our dollhouse. We have an example Althea router that we can uh, potentially play around with. Um, and um, I'm going to run through getting both of these devices configured. Uh, so we'll pull up the setup for both of them. I don't know how many people have seen the Ubiquiti stuff before, but we'll get to see that. Um, set all the settings. We'll set them up. Uh, we'll put one on the other side of the room. We'll fiddle around with uh, pointing them in different directions and seeing how the stats change. Try some of the troubleshooting tools that they have built in. Um, so that's, uh, that'll be what this is for. And then we are also going to um, workshop uh, building Ethernet cables. So um, if you get much into building these networks, you're going to have to start making your own cables. For those of you that haven't yet, we're going to practice and see how that works and uh, how the tools work and how the tester works. And how much time do we have? We have until 5. So we've got, uh, uh, OK. Uh, but you could probably go a little longer too. I mean, okay, cool. Away. Yeah, I think we'll be okay. Okay, so let's start with this. Give me just a minute to set up on the screen. Um, okay, so quick note. Uh, where's the... It's in the behind that panel there. It's okay, so these devices are PoE, power over Ethernet. Meaning they get their power from the Ethernet. So um, in here, uh, we've got this little brick. This comes with the device. On, uh, it has two Ethernet ports on it. Uh, many of you might be familiar with this, but um, one side has PoE, so it sends power and data out, goes up into this device. The other side gets connected into the network. All right, now it's connected to our Althea router right here. I'm going to unplug it and plug it into my laptop so that I can get into the uh, management interface of this device and we can start configuring it. What's that? Wrapped it up nice and tight. Yeah, right? <laughs> I guess I could just grab a new cable. So this is a pretty good representation of if we were hooking up a customer, a residential home customer, what might go on their roof. This device is outdoor, designed to go outdoor and could actually just sit on somebody's roof. This little arm mount works really well up on the rooftops. We'll talk more about how kind of installing on a customer tomorrow. But if you're curious, if you haven't seen before what it might look like. Uh, this, you know, this, this whole setup right here is just what would actually go up on their roof. This would aim toward an access point and this could be their whole installation. So um, the person installing would do some of what we're going to do right now. Good. Okay. As a note, the maximum run distance for Ethernet is 100 meters. Oh, that's a good point. Everybody hear that? So Ethernet, if you're running an Ethernet cable, the maximum distance you can go is 100 meters. It's like 320 feet or so. so. Why is that? That's just how they're designed. Similar thing. The, there's some loss in the signal across the cable, and they're designed to work up to about 100 meters. Okay. If you plug it in something and then out the other end, so like put it into a router and then yep. out another port of the router, it resets. So. Yeah, so you, yeah, you have to put a switch or something in between if you need to go longer or just move to fiber, you can get up to kilometers distance with fiber connections. So, you know, that's the way. Yeah, coax can go for that too. Okay, so uh, to get into this device, um, the first thing I need to do is, oh, I already have it configured. So these devices run their own web servers, so you can log into them directly. By default, um, the address of the server is, and they have these, I think, printed on them and printed on the box, but it's uh, 192.168.1.20. All right. Does it do DHCP? 
It does not. These do not do DHCP, they act as bridges. So what that means, the question is, does it do DHCP? You have to do some configuration on your laptop or device that you're logging in from to be able to get into this. The easiest thing to do, if, you, if you're not familiar with subnetting and don't really know, just give your... You DHCP client. Like, so sorry. can I plug it into my router and then access it as another client? Uh, you could, but only if it's providing IP addresses on that same range already, 1.2.1.6.8.1. One, so it's what? Uh, that range is common. So. That range is common, so, so that's true. As long as there didn't have to be a, happen to be a conflict already on 20. The easiest thing to do is just open up the configuration settings on your computer and give yourself this address, 192.168.125. You have to also set the subnet mask, 255.255.255.0, and then you'll be able to log in directly. This is for logging directly into the nano beam. But it's pretty similar for any ubiquity device. So as soon as you plug it into your laptop, just it up? No, I had to open this. So this is specific to my Mac. But Windows or other devices will have something similar. We have on the online instructions. Okay, there you go. We have online instructions. Just to show again how I got there for the Mac. Uh, um, hard to drive in both places network preferences, and then I'm looking at the settings for the Ethernet device, not the Wi-Fi device, for the device that's actually plugged into the radio. So I'm here, I have myself set to 192.168.125, and yeah, we have, and Ubiquity has instructions on this. This is pretty easy to find, so uh, you don't have to necessarily remember everything that I'm saying. Um, we're going to get a security risk because of the way uh, HTTPS works, but we're going to click through. And here is the first screen of our, uh, from a, a totally um, out of the box, nothing done to it, ubiquity device. This is what we'll see. I think uh, the firmware, there are newer firmware versions on this that might look a little bit different, but this is a, a fairly recent version of firmware. And um, again, this is printed on the box and easy to find, but the uh, default, I believe, is UBNT and UBNT. I have to set my country the first time, agree to the terms of use, and then I'm in. Okay, here we go. So this is the uh, interface for this device. You can log into this directly, um, and it shows you a bunch of helpful information that we'll make more use of as we go. First thing we're going to do is configure this to get it ready to be part of our link. So. Um, configuring this is pretty simple. Um, in our situation, we're going to make this side the access point. So you need to have, uh, to hook these things together, one, if we're hooking one to one, we need one, one of them to be an access point, the other side will be a station. So we're going to do our access point first. Um, uh, We'll leave that as it is. SSID, uh, we'll use Althea. The SSID is similar to the SSID when you're setting up your router. It just needs to be the same across all your devices that are connecting. Um, we'll use a 40 megahertz channel. Uh, let's pick, well, actually, okay. Um, so a couple things here that we've talked about. Channel size, we've talked about. These are the options in this particular radio. Bigger the channel size, more data throughput, and uh, both sides do need to match. So we're just going to leave it at 40 megahertz. Frequency, we've looked at all the different frequencies available. Um, uh, I'm just going to pick, um, let's do, we'll just do 5300. Uh, the access point side is the only side that needs the channel configured. The client side will scan and connect uh, uh, regardless of the channel. So, so you don't need to set the, we'll see that when we get there. Um, that's really all we need to configure to make this work. But just to see a few of the other things we've talked about. Um, the MCS rate, we can tell it if we for some reason wanted to set the maximum speed of the device. Maybe we have reason to believe that it won't perform well at higher MCS rates and we want to just limit it. We can do that here. 
I usually don't. I usually just let it go as high as it will go, but we can if we wanted to. Um, and we can set security just like you would on your home, on your home router. Um, I think I'll leave that off for, for simplicity, but if you were deploying in the field, you would probably want to set a security key so that the traffic can't be sniffed out of the air. So the question here is around um, WDS transparent bridge mode. Um, uh, that's a feature that I, th I think originally in the, wi in the Wi-Fi spec, a Wi-Fi bridge uh, isn't transparent, meaning that MAC addresses on devices don't just, and, and frames don't just flow through. Um, and if we set WDS transparent, transparency mode, then the bridge itself becomes really just a bridge and data isn't changed as it goes through. I don't remember all the specifics, but I think that that can, in theory, limit um, uh, interoperability with some other devices, but should increase performance. So if we were not using all ubiquity devices, we may want to consider not setting that, but if we are, then I think it's fine. Is that, is that your? Yeah, um, that question? and, it, and, um, and it lets you just think of the antennas as big as fancy Ethernet cables. Right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the trans, yeah, yeah, exactly. It, it makes it totally transparent that nothing, uh, data go, comes in exactly as it came out, where it might not if we didn't do that. Right, I, I think that's fair. Anything else at this point? Probably should grab the firmware because I feel like the newer firmware has a lot of other stuff. But yeah, I'm noticing EFS frequency Yeah, so yeah, that's good. Good. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about all those things. So one thing noticed here is that the channel has DFS next to it. That's just a convenience thing that Ubiquity's put in here to tell you which channels are uh, um, DFS, uh, have to abide by DFS. So if I select a channel here that has DFS next to it, I know that I might have to, it might move if it, if it hears DFS, if it has to jump for DFS. So that's a good point. Um, uh, another thing here is uh, the, the output power, the transmit power, we've talked about that. This is gonna be transmitting at 14 dBm. Um, which is the max. Uh, that um, should take into account all relevant regulations, so I'm safe to put that all the way up, although I might, uh, based on what I'm trying to do, want to turn that down. In fact, I will want to turn that down because we're going to be so close. Uh, the other things that you can configure when you're in here, you can change the password, which would probably sh is obviously good practice. You can um, set up various services if you have different ways of monitoring your network. Uh, um, like enabling or disabling SD, SSH and Telnet connections. Um, and uh, you can also set up uh, NTP so that the time, the N NTP sets the time in the device so that the time will always be right. Let's, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and save it. We'll, we will configure the other side and then we can go through and kind of play with some of these other changes. Yeah. Okay, so we've got that access point. I'm going to configure this one as our station. Hmm? I'll just I'll just do um I'll I'll do it and then we'll move it over there and power it up and connect it. Yeah, I was just gonna try to grab the firmware while I waited for the other one to boot up, but uh, it probably gonna take too long. Okay, so uh, so we're in this, we're in the next one, or we're gonna get in the next one. Same thing. Um, it uh, should have the same. There we go. So it's also the same address, 192.168.1.20. We're gonna skip right through. I've got the same screen.
and uh, and here we are again. So I'm going to change the same things here and uh, and a few other things. We're going to make this one a station. Our first one was an access point, so this one will be a station that will connect to the access point. Um, I'm going to enable WS, WDS transparency mode. Set this to Althea. Um, the channel width. I can leave it on auto or 20 or four, auto 2040, since we set the other one to 40. Um, and uh, that is all I have to change to get them to connect. Oh yeah, yeah, I was going to get to that. Uh, so if I if I oh, yeah. and the password. So uh, if I got them to connect right now, they should just connect. The problem would be that they're both on the same IP address. So we wouldn't be able to manage them individually, which would be uh, difficult. So I'm going to change the IP address in this one as well. I do that on the network page. Sometimes they take a little while to save and apply. Or even timeout. <laughs> Come on. There we go. Okay, so here I'm going to change this one. This one is set to 192.168.1.20. I'm going to change it to 21. That way I can manage each of these devices individually. So now I've changed this one, this one's uh, IP address to 192.168.1.21. You can see that I can now, excuse me, I now can log in on that new IP address. Um, and it should have, uh, and yeah, so now I'm, now I'm back in. Now, next thing is we're going to get them connected together. So we're going to take this one, put it over on that side of the room somewhere, point it back at this one connect them up, and if I did everything right, they should just connect. So, fingers crossed. Yeah, maybe we can just strap it to the chair or something. Okay, let's see what happens. Uh, oh, he's getting that part up. Okay. These do have a little signal light indicator. Some of the Ubiquiti's products do, some don't. These ones do. On the side here, it's probably kind of hard to see from there, but there's some blue lights. One of them is a, a signal indicator indicating if they're connected and how strong they're connected. They are not yet, but they probably will be soon. Um, so, so right now I'm going to um, I'm going to log into this device, and uh, should be able to see them connect. Hopefully, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I knew I would forget. Is this interface also available? By a Wi-Fi, if you're doing an access point. Um, yes, actually. I'm asking because I've seen HTTPS and I wonder why. Oh. Connection. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, that's a good point. They well, so there's a couple. Of, so the question is, is this interface available via Wi-Fi and related? Why is it HTTPS instead of just HTTP, right? So uh, a couple things for both questions. One, it is available via Wi-Fi, and in fact, newer Ubiquiti radios, I don't know if these ones do, but some of the very latest products have a separate Wi-Fi network that you can connect to with your phone and be able to manage this device by connecting to that Wi-Fi network rather than having to plug in. 
which is, uh, yeah, really useful, really helpful, makes things a lot easier um, uh, when, when they have it. So, so that's, that's one kind of piece of that question. The other piece is that maybe true that uh, SSL is a little bit overkill, but this is available over the network. So if I'm sitting at one edge of my network and traversing a whole bunch of different devices to get to uh, man the management device for another part of the network, if, the, if it was an SSL, then all that traffic would be in the clear and potentially able to be intercepted. So that's, I think, why it's SSL. Okay, my lights have lit up here. I don't know if you can see them, uh, but if you can, there's four blue lights here. That means this is connected in it with as strong a signal as it can get. So if I refresh, I should see a connection. Uh, so um, by default, the, the page shows these two graphs, throughput, um, throughput and capacity. Um, I'm gonna click on stations, and that's gonna show everything that is connected to this device. So I just, uh, so we've got the one device connected here, and we can see some stats about it. We can see its MAC address, its device name, which is configurable. We see its uh, um, T, uh, TX and RX signal, so that means uh, one is how loud, so, so this is showing bo both sides of the link's uh, receive signal level. We can see there are negative 33 and negative 38, so very loud. That's because we're so close. Um, we can see our noise level, which is how much other noise is in the environment. Negative 98, which is quite low, so this should be performing very well. Our latency, which is the amount of time that it takes data to get uh, from one side to the other and back, usually. Uh, one millisecond, also very low. Distance, which I think is even overestimated here at a tenth of a mile. Um, <laughs> Or uh, this is what I call a tenth of a mile when I'm jogging, actually. So this seems about right. <laughs> uh, our TX and RX data rate, which, if you remember, we talked about MCS rates, uh, and this so this is estimating what it thinks that it can actually transfer across the link. So 300 megabits both ways. Um, the CCQ is a is a Wi-Fi thing that measures the quality of the connection, um, and uh, and how much of the connection is available at any time. Um, and, and it's estimating it at 100%, which is great. Connection time, how long they've been up, and the IP address of the other side. So we see a bunch of information there about these devices. Um, there's a couple of other things that we can do. Um, uh, to, to, test the, to test the connection and play with the connection. So um, I'm just trying to decide if I want to do the firmware first. <laughs> uh, but we'll show it on this first, and then we'll, and we'll see. So these devices have some, some uh, helpful tools built into them. One of those helpful tools is a speed test. This speed test does, uh, if you're familiar with iPerf, it does something very similar to an iPerf from one device to the other. So you're getting slow speeds and it's, you know, you have six of these links all daisy chained off of each other and you're trying to figure out which one of them is underperforming. That can be kind of difficult. You can use this speed test feature to do a quick speed test between any ubiquity device and any other ubiquity device and help you begin to narrow down where this problem might be in your network. Is that a generic network tool? Or is it specific to? It is specific. The question is, is that a generic network tool or is it specific to ubiquity? I believe that it is specific enough that you can't easily test from another device directly to a ubiquity device. It's probably possible, but I think it is iPerf down underneath somewhere, but I don't, I, I think they change it somehow. Will the firmware auto-update across the network? It will not. The question was, will the firmware auto-update across the network? Uh, by default, it will not automatically update. There are tools like UNMS that I mentioned earlier that will manage that for you and will do uh, firmware updates for you, or you can do firmware updates manually. I think in just a minute, I'll show the firmware update process. We'll get both of these updated. Oh, good question. So, question: Do you have to actually physically go to the station to update it? The answer is no. You can update it across the across the network. It just by default, when you plug it in, it won't do it itself automatically. You have to log into it and tell it to do that. Um, but uh, but again, there is there are tools like UNMS where that can be automated. So let's try running a throughput test, and then, and then I think we'll upgrade the firmware. 
So like I mentioned, we can actually test to any other Ubiquiti device. So if I had another Ubiquiti device way out somewhere else on the network, as long as I have its IP address and those IP addresses are routable between each other, I can, I can throughput test uh, to the other one. But in this case, I'm just going to throughput test to, uh, directly to, fr from this device to that device. Um, I do have to know the username and password of both sides in order to do this. So I'm going to put in the username and password. And um, there are some other options here. So when I'm testing, I can either test throughput from here to there. So basically send from here to there. I can test from there to here. So basically receive. Or I can have it do both. So the options are duplex, which is have it do both, send or receive. Let's just do duplex for this. For this. And then I can tell it how long I want it to run the test. Uh, go. Oh, yeah, it's running. OK, so you can see the results as they start to come in. So uh, with both, so it's trying to send as much as it can and receive as much as it can at the same time. And right now I'm hitting about 180 to total, which is about 80 to 90 each way which is about what's expected. So it'll run for 30 seconds. What's that? Good point. 300 is uh, what we would hope to expect since it said 300. You would think that it could do 300. <laughs> uh, so A, it is in perfect connections and in perfect conditions. It also, that includes some overhead. The 300 includes some overhead. And the 300 is only one way. So the 300, so that, one set, so um, yeah, the 300 is kind of like a marketing number. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, exactly. 150 up, 150 back, 300. Um, uh, right, yeah, yeah. So the cynical thing is that that 180 is 300. <laughs> but, uh, but, but that's because there's overhead and they're adding them together. And yeah. Let's actually try just doing one direction and see. Uh, let's do transmit. Because you'll remember we talked about that uh, these devices are half duplex. Again, that means that they can only send or receive. They can't be doing both at any one time. So. Uh, okay, so now we're getting yeah, about 151 direction, which I think is where that 300 yeah, comes in. So yeah, so that this is a helpful um, uh, troubleshooting tool. I use this a lot, trying to troubleshoot speed problems. There's some other things in here. Um, uh, ping, uh, many of you are pr probably familiar with ping. Ping just sends a message from one spot to another spot, and then it should come right back. So uh, if you're just trying to see if a device is alive and responding, ping does that. Um, uh, we've got some other uh, statistics here. I'm actually going to log into the client side. OK, so, so this that I'm looking at, what, what's happening here is my laptop is connected directly to this side, which is acting as the access point. But I am logging in through this, through the Wi-Fi, over to that one. So this interface is actually coming from that device. Similar information over here. Um, uh, this side we have uh, signal strength. So we see what our, our, our received signal strength is up there in the top right. Uh, we also have um, this that indicates throughput rates, TX and RX. So if I started using this connection, um, I would see these rates start to go up. Or if I were logging into one of my customers to check their, their speed or their performance, I would be able to see right here what they're using at any given time. Um, I can also run the same diagnostic tools, speed test, et cetera, from here. Um, and uh, the other thing we were going to see is discovery. Yeah. I really want to do the new firmware. But so this is, if I, if I have it set as a client, 
I can go in and use this discovery tool and this will show me every other access point that, it's, that, it, that I can see, uh, ubiquity or otherwise. So we can see that we're seeing all 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi networks here, including ours, which is Althea there up at the top. Um, could you talk a little bit more about what AirMax does? Yeah, so, so AirMax, the question is, can we talk about what AirMax does and doesn't do? And um, I probably should have refreshed myself on this. I probably could and maybe be more in-depth tomorrow. But um, AirMax is Ubiquiti's um, set of Wi-Fi enhancements, basically. So, so uh, we talked a little bit earlier about how these Ubiquiti devices are compatible with Wi-Fi. Again, I could use one of these devices to connect to any of these other standard Wi-Fi networks. In reverse, I could connect my laptop to a, a Ubiquiti Wi-Fi device. But if I want to get the most performance out of these devices, I would enable AirMax, which changes the way that the Wi-Fi protocol works a little bit, enough that it's no longer backwards compatible, but it works better in the scenarios where these devices are often going to be deployed like outside long, long distances. Some of the things that it changes, um, uh, I, I, I think, I, I, I can't remember all of the specifics, but some of the things that it, that it can change are things like how the contention protocol works and moving to timed rather than contention based. I think when you turn on AirMax, it's always timing based, although it's not always GPS based. Um, and uh, um, I think that that's the primary thing, but I think that there are some other things too that I can't remember. <laughs> It is, FC yeah, uh, so another follow-up question, is that FCC approved, right? Yes. So the FCC uh, doesn't, so th this only, um, the FCC really only regulates uh, gain and TX power. They don't care too much what you actually send on the, on the waves as long as it's not overpowered or um, over gain. Uh, so, so yeah, it is still within FCC regulations. So this is your max, how is that new, where is that? I'm sorry. The Air Max is it? It's a piece of equipment or? Something? Oh, it's just a setting. It's just a setting in the device. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let me. Uh, I think. Why don't we upgrade the firmware on these? It'll take just a minute. Um, and then I think there's a lot of the newer firmware looks a lot different and has some other cool features that I think we can check out if I do that. So, if you can be patient with me for a minute while I do that, uh, I think that will be helpful. Okay, so a note on upgrading firmware if you're going to upgrade manually, or really if you're going to make any change manually. Um, uh, you, you want to make sure you don't lock yourself out and leave the stuff down where you can't get to it and you have to drive there to get it. <laughs> so in this situation, just as an example, I'm plugged in here to the access point. That means I'm getting to the client through the access point. If I make a change, that means the client can't talk to the access point then I have to go to, the, go to the client and change it back before I can get back online. So I don't want to do that because that means getting in the truck and driving over there when I'm not in the same room. So uh, one way to be careful about that, there's a couple things. One is that Ubiquiti, you'll notice, and I'll, and I'll point it out again when we go through, Ubiquiti by default will put, let you put changes in test mode. I Meaning when I apply a change, it will, um, uh, it'll, apply that change, but then if I don't confirm that I want to keep that change within, I think, 30 seconds, it will, it will remove that change. So that's helpful. It can kind of save you from a bad situation. The other thing, though, is that in, in most cases, I want to make the change on the far end first um, and then change this end. So, for example, if I were going to change the SSID to something, I would change it on the client side first and then change it here, and then they would both come back up, and then I don't have to go there. So I'm going to do that when I do the firmware. I'm going to upgrade that side first, and then I'm going to upgrade this side. I guess while, while we're waiting on that to upgrade, uh, we'll do a little preview of what comes next. What happened to my cable? Oh, it's in the house. Oh, there we go. OK, so uh, once we move on from this, we're going to start talking about how to make Ethernet cables. So uh, if you haven't done it before, it's, uh, uh, it's not too bad. There's this this particular cable, um, yeah. Are you going to talk about the properties of the cable and choosing the right outdoor cable? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So this, uh, uh, what, what we're asking here, uh, there's, there's a lot of different kinds of Cat5 and Cat6 cable. This particular cable is uh, outdoor rated. It's shielded, meaning um, when I open it up, I'll show you, but there's a, a foil sheath around the cables on the inside. The uh, jacket is also designed to be UV safe, meaning it can be exposed to, to sunlight without degrading, you know, immediately. <laughs> um, uh, if you're not familiar with Cat5 cable, this is Cat5e. Uh, it has eight individual conductors inside. They're twisted into pairs, so that we call it four pair. There are four pairs inside. Um, there are four different colors, red, orange, green, and blue. Uh, so there's a, uh, I, I'm sorry, <laughs> orange, green, blue, and brown, right? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, and so you'll have orange, like a solid orange. We'll see more when I open it up, but there's a solid orange and then a striped orange, solid green, striped green, etc. cetera. And um, to terminate them, we uh, open it up, straighten them out, put them in the clip, uh, in the right order, and then crimp the clip down and uh, connect the sheath. So we'll, we'll get there in just a minute uh, when this is done. Just wanted to uh, uh, start looking at that. This is a crimping tool. This is what we use to crimp them. And uh, a tester. We'll check out the tester too. Yeah, that's a good point. So. Uh, he pointed out the cables are twisted together and they are twisted, each of them are twisted at slightly different rates and that's to cancel noise from each other so they don't interfere with each other essentially. Cool, okay, so we got one side upgraded. I upgraded that side, it looks like they did connect back up so that's great. I'm gonna go ahead and upgrade this side. So a little bit more about Cat5. Um, we talked, uh, so, there's Cat5, Cat5e, and Cat6. Cat5 isn't um, really used anymore. Cat5e is, any, anytime, anytime you hear Cat5, it almost always means Cat5e. Cat5e is designed to support up to a gigabit. Um, there are some newer technologies that will let it go even beyond a gigabit, but typically it will uh, support up to a gigabit of traffic. Um, and, and like we mentioned earlier, it's, it will only work up to 100 meters. So if the run is longer than 100 meters, you'll start to see problems on the Cat5 interface. You'll start to see uh, packet loss, et cetera. Yeah. Um, in case I need more than 100 meters, is uh, repeater overhead significant? Uh, no, if you put um, a switch in, there will be very little, if any, noticeable overhead. Um, but you know, if you need to go 10 kilometers or something, you're not gonna wanna put a switch in every 100 meters, so a different type of media is, is appropriate. But yeah, if you need to go like 150 meters, then you can just put a switch in the middle and you probably won't notice any degradation. For a non-tech guy, most existing houses already have cabling in them, especially if they had a satellite network of any sort. Mm -hmm. Is there an easy way to test the cabling so that you know you have a good cable? Uh, yeah, well, there are, there are ways to do that. There are easy, somewhat fallible ways and expensive, uh, good ways. <laughs> so uh, the, the easiest, well, so a couple things. One, satellite and, and uh, cable TV use coaxial cable, which is different, very different kind of cable. Um, can be used for networking, but um, mm -hmm. at some point you will need a Cat5 because this thing runs on Cat5. So that's one point. To your uh, broader point though, s some homes do have Cat5 in them. And uh, there are testers that you can get. There are really nice ones that are like 1500 bucks, but they'll tell you everything about the cable. And there are ones that are $40, like this one. Yeah, that will tell you it will probably work. <laughs> We're probably gonna do that. I kind of led into the question. What's that? Oh yeah, we are gonna, te yeah, we are gonna test it, yeah. Okay, so let's see what we got with our new. Okay, a uh, couple of things I wanted to point out. So this is Arrow. If you are be going to be using Ubiquity, I forgot, and you reminded me, thank you, that um, this is their newest version of firmware called Arrow OS 8. 
and it's pretty nice. It has a lot of cool features um, and is presented really nicely. Uh, I had forgotten that it's not available for these types of devices yet. Um, so just a little preview. This is what it looks like. It, it looks a little bit different, and um, Ubiquiti's really been trying to uh, make the configuration pages on all their devices look uh, more consistent. Um, and this is kind of that a step in that direction. So if you do go home and start getting Ubiquiti devices and upgrading the firmware, you'll probably see something that looks more like that. But um, to check out these devices, I think we did get some new stuff. Um, yeah, yeah. A couple of things. Uh, um, did I? Oh, no, I thought AirView might work without that. Um, anyway, so uh, I guess we didn't get a lot. One key thing that we get here, though, is UNMS, which we talked about a little bit. UNMS is Ubiquiti's free network management system. Um, and uh, so if you are deploying a lot of uh, network devices, you, you can do that. Basically, uh, it gives you a centralized interface that you can um, manage all of your devices from one place, including things like firmware upgrades and watching for outages and checking statistics, et cetera. And uh, so um, that's what that little UNMS icon is for. Um, it is free, but you have to in install it on a server somewhere inside your network where it has direct access to all of the devices. Um, so, so yeah, I, I think actually most everything else ends up being pretty similar to what we've already seen. Yeah. I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about the noise floor and what numbers we're looking for. Oh, there. sure. Yeah. Uh, so let me get. Um, yeah, this will show a lot of them. So the question is, uh, talking about the noise floor, and what numbers are expected there and what that means. So the noise floor is um, kind of what it sounds like. We, we have our, our signal, so these two are talking to each other. And the, you know this one can hear that one at a certain level and vice versa. The noise floor indicates how much other stuff is going on in the environment. So the more other 5 gigahertz devices that are around here talking, uh, the higher the noise floor is going to be. And it is also measured in dBm, decibel milliwatts. So it is directly comparable to the received signal level. So another important number, um, so we've talked about our received signal level. We've talked about the noise floor. Another important, important number is the signal to noise ratio, meaning how much higher is the signal than the noise. Um, so you can look at these and see. Uh, um, it shows right here on one side the signal, on the other side the noise. So we've got negative 60 to negative 96 in this case signal to noise ratio. In general, in order to get the highest throughput rates, you need uh, I think at least 18 and probably closer to 20 dB difference between the signal and the noise. So uh, most of the time um, if, you're, if you're getting a good received signal level, good meaning maybe 55 or better, uh, unless it's a really noisy environment, most of the time your signal to noise is okay. But it is good to look at the signal to noise specifically. You can see in our, you know, in our situation, uh, or there with the top one, the signal is 32 and the noise is negative 96. So that's going to be really great. It's going to be totally fine. But if you look down here, you know, where there's some of these lower ones, 72 and 96, for example, you probably aren't going to get full throughput rates connecting to that, to, to that network. Makes sense. Along those lines, let's actually try turning down the power and see how that affects it. So I'm going to turn down the client side first, and let's just turn it all the way down. Roll the dice, see what happens. And uh, so here I'm gonna, I just clicked test. If you saw that blue, blue bar come up at the top saying test apply or discard, that gave me the option to test the changes. That means the changes will be applied, but they'll be rolled back if I don't apply within, uh, I, think it's, I think it's 30 seconds. Maybe it's, maybe it's a few minutes, I can't remember now. So, so I uh, tested that. 
Oh, and here we go. I have uh, 162 seconds to apply the changes. If I don't, the changes will revert. So I've done that. I'm going to come in this side and do the same thing. I'm going to test the changes. So I just turned both of the transmit powers down to negative 4 dBm. Anybody remember how many milliwatts that is? About. Just under a half, yeah. Negative three would be half a milliwatt. Okay, so we've got applied. Let's see what happened to our signal levels. So the question is, we're waiting right now for these to connect. Is that because of DFS, because it's clearing the channel? Uh, yeah, it probably is. So this device does have to wait for 60 seconds before it can transmit. I thought it, I thought it said somewhere if it was doing that. Um, oh yeah, DFS wait. Yeah, it's a good point. Right, uh, right there by channel frequency, you can see it says DFS wait. And I believe that that is because it's clearing the channel for DFS. So we have to wait 60 seconds before it'll actually start broadcasting and talking to each other. Okay, we'll let that write. Is there anything, uh, any other questions about the interface or things people are curious to see about how these, how these work? The question is, is there a programmatic API for managing the configuration of these devices? If you wanted to write code that would configure them for you? And the answer is there is not a specifically designed programmatic API, but there are some things you can do, like you can download in order to back up the configuration files, and uh, you, you can then open them up in a text editor and change them and re-upload them. Um, there is also a command line interface, so you can uh, you get a command line open to one of these things and make textual, if not directly programmatic, changes. Um, so there are some things you can do, but not a direct programmatic API. Uh, so if I understand your question, it's, is there uh, other things like SNMP to be able to pull data in from a bunch of devices at once? So the answer is yes. Ubiquity's support of SNMP isn't great. Um, other, other manufacturers have better SNMP support, but they do support SNMP, I think only version 1, um, but they do support it. They also do have UNMS, we've talked about a couple of times, that does basically exactly that using Ubiquiti's own proprietary stuff, but it will go out and grab signal information, statistics, et cetera, from all devices and present it in one dashboard. Does that answer your question? Okay. Uh, oh, yeah. So that's the, uh, so the question, what's the noise floor on the right side halfway down? And that is just uh, what is the noise floor that this thing sees at the current moment? Um, with its, with it, uh, I think since it's not connected, it's not as meaningful, but um, because it would correspond to its current connection. But, um, and floor in this context? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. The question is, what does, why is it called noise floor and not just noise? Is that what you're asking? I think it's just a terminology thing, but it's, um, it's kind of, it's the reason is, whoops, uh, it's, um, so you have all this noise, and then the signal kind of pops up above it, and it just is, kind of looks like a floor. I think that's why the term is floor. Cool. Yeah. Wanted to spend time with you with cable, and then if there was any other questions. Oh, sure. Yeah. Those, yeah. Good idea. Yeah. So I think we will. I'll do a quick demo of building a cable, and then we can kind of split up into people who want to learn how to build cables, and and we can also maybe play around with this some more. So. Uh, okay. Let's go back to cabling. What's your preferred uh, um, cabling standard or termination? Like uh, a or, are you asking A or B? Uh, okay, so the question is, uh, so there are two standards for the order in which you terminate cabling pairs, and I actually need to pull up my slide that shows it. They're called 568A and 568B. Um, industry seems to have converged on 568B, so that's what I do, but um, well, I'll, show, I'll show everybody that when we, when we get to the ordering. Let me let me pull Sorry, up the. No, no, it's fine. It's a good question. I probably I might have forgot to. <laughs> okay, I guess that's good, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, um, okay, jumping back into cabling. 
so we talked about Ethernet cable, 100 meter uh, distance. Um, mostly we use Cat5e, uh, at least mostly I do, rather than Cat6. The only reason, there's two reasons that I usually use Cat5e. One is that I've found that it's easier to find really good outdoor rated Cat5e cables rather than Cat6. The other reason is it's quite a bit easier to terminate, so that's nice. And you don't get a whole lot of benefits moving to Cat6 uh, unless you're trying to push beyond one gigabit anyway, which most of the time we're not. So Cat5e seems fine for most applications. But um, you can certainly do Cat6 if you prefer. Hmm? It's and it's cheaper. Yeah. <laughs> cheaper, easier to make. Yep. And, um, and uh, for our applications, they're largely interchangeable. This will work on a Cat6 and will work on a Cat5e. So. So uh, this, uh, this particular brand of cable, this is Shireen. Again, it's outdoor rated, shielded. I'm going to cut it open and show the shielding. When you're making Cat5 cables, uh, it's nice to have a little stripper like this. Use this to remove the outer sheath of the cable. I'll move it back. So I'll go back even further so we can see the insides nicely. So inside here, we've got this outer stuff is the sheet, the sheet, the shield. If you're doing indoor cable, you won't probably have the shield. But for uh, uh, the shield and, and what we're doing is nice because it can act as a ground. So we have some, uh, uh, so we don't have static building up on either side, and so that static that could potentially interfere with our signal gets grounded through the chassis of the devices on either side rather than hitting the copper uh, actual. Um, uh, inside the cable here. Um, okay, so a couple things. This, this little string is just here for convenience. It's so that you can rip, uh, cable, rip the sheath if you need to strip it back further. You get that. Um, and you can just cut it off. Oh, where'd my snips go? Um, inside the sheath, or inside the shield, we've got the uh, Four different pairs. Thank you. They're wrapped in a little bit of plastic usually. I'll do that. So here's our four pairs. So I'm going to trim this back. Usually I wouldn't cut all of that off. I just wanted to give us a lot of room to be able to see what's going on. Usually I'll need a little bit off. Difference, like I know some of them have a ground wire, like yeah. So what is it? Just five E six? Like is it certain types or just a different type of cable? Good question. The question is, some of them have a ground wire, some of them don't. Some of them have uh, shielding, some of them don't. What's the difference there? So there are a bunch of different uh, types of Cat five, and they they're. Um, you can see the name as, as like uh, S, STP, which stands for shielded twisted pair. I think there's FTP, which is like foil twisted pair. Uh, there's a few others. Um, so they're, they're kind of subtypes of Cat5e. Um, so I think that's an interesting question. Is there a certain circumstance that you know of, like where you'd use the one with the grounding, the grounding line yeah. and not? Yeah, so uh, anything outdoor, and especially where you are have elevation change. So if you're going from up high to lower, that's a good situation to use one with a grounding wire and a shield. And a shield. Um, if it's inside, it's probably less important um, unless you have, uh, I don't know, a lot of electromagnetic interference going on or something. Okay, so he's, the, the point for the, for the microphone is that inside a building, if you're running a big bundle of cables, um, the, uh, the shielding can actually cause a problem in, in adding so much metal and kind of becoming an a, a interference problem. So uh, we've got four, four cables here, brown, green, blue, and orange. And our goal is to get them in the connector in this order, crimped down like that. Okay, so the question is, the question is, uh, is there any way to protect the cabling against lightning? If lightning were to actually strike and hit the hit the cable, is there any way to protect against that, right? It's a good question. So a couple of things. One is that um, 
if you're up on top of a building, hopefully the building has, if it's a high, tall commercial building that is at risk for having uh, lightning strikes, then hopefully it has its own lightning, lightning rod that is going to take all the lightning so the lightning never hits something like this. That's hopefully the situation. Might not be the situation, but hopefully it is. The other thing is, if you are concerned about that, uh, if lightning hits the wire, the wire is gone. There's no way around that, it's, it's gone. Your, your goal is to make sure, as to the extent that you can, that it doesn't start a fire inside the house. It really becomes a safety issue. So um, there's no way to protect your cable. It's, it's gonna be totally gone. There are some devices that you can use to try to keep the surge from going into the house. And they're called um, lightning suppression or surge suppression. Ubiquity makes some specific for their devices. It's a little white box. It's designed to go outside, right um, on the outside wall uh, where the cable goes into the home. And it's just, a, it's just a coupler, basically, but it's got some surge suppression built into it. And it has a ground uh, connector. So the idea is you have your cable from outside plugging in. You have the ground going into the ground. And then you have another cable going from the other side of the coupler into the house. And, and the idea is that it, uh, 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 it's, it's basically a fuse. And if lightning hit that, it would blow up the box and not go into the house. Cool. Um, OK, um, how about some, some kind of BPO shielding? Because, well, direct. A direct hit from lightning, lightning isn't all that probable, in my opinion. Right. But what if you've got a power cable running nearby? I, I had hmm. a friend who had storm near in his in his area. It his, hit his house. It went through. It went through the power cable, and then induced current in an unplugged network hmm. device because of the cable lying nearby. Right. Um, yeah. So. Uh, couple of things um, along those lines. Um, the main thing, that when we'll actually get into this more tomorrow, but the main thing is that if you ground, so that's, that's one of the reasons why using shielded cable is good in these situations. If you properly ground your installations, then the shielding on the cable will be uh, connected to the chassis ground of each of the devices. And if the devices themselves are ground, then any induced current should ground to the ground through the device chassis. So just ground all the things. Ground all the things, yeah. And, and make sure when we make the cable that uh, it's made with the shield and the shield is in. So you can see, actually this is a good point. You can see this uh, and we can pass these around. I can toss it around or we can come look at it during the workshop or whatever. You'll notice this has uh, metal around it, which you might recognize most Cat 5s that you would find in your office don't. The reason for that is that that metal is intended to be in contact with the with the foil shield around the cable, and also in contact with the chassis of the device you're connecting it to. Um, and then that creates uh, you know, conductive points between those two, and then both the devices on both sides should be grounded, meaning that uh, any, any current inducted would, would go to the ground. Any other questions? Top cable has another copper wire through the ground, right? So is that just like the backup yeah. with the shielding? Yeah, it's just another way to make sure they're connected in there. Yeah. The wire always breaks, though. Yeah, it's hard to keep it. It's hard to keep. This one actually, uh, I think, does too. Or some of them do. I don't actually see it on this one, but. The problem that people, yeah. So the t the questions we're talking about tough cable, which is Ubiquity's branded uh, outdoor cable. Maybe they've fixed it, but they used to not be as UV shielded as they claim to be. And a lot of people had problems where they put them out in the field and after a summer or two, the, shield, the sheath on the, on the ubiquity tough cable would just crumble and the cables would fall apart. So I don't tend to recommend tough cable just because I don't trust it for that. Maybe they've fixed it, but. Um, okay, so uh, should we split up or sh yeah, should we so kind of split up into? Is, is go ahead and just do some milling around. I think that those sort of questions are easier to guys make person to person. So the Althea crew will be here. Um, and then if anybody wants to spend some time with Graham or with someone, um, you know, building the big the cables, doing some Amazon stuff, or working with the radio dashboard, yeah. we're all going to help with that as well. Okay. And Should I keep? We're back here tomorrow at 9.30.